Thank you for joining me. This uh, lesson has been delayed because of catastrophic uh, software failure, and I'm sorry about that. It just destroyed the first video entirely. But we're going to get in right into it. The crucibles that come is our lesson, and we'll do that right away. Well, our quarter lessons are about the crucible, being the crucible with Christ. And uh, our lesson author has decided to pick out a bunch of crucibles. Uh, I'm not sure that that's uh, an accurate description of what he's done, but that's the lesson we have, and that's what we're going to study. And we're going to start out with some very interesting texts. Our memory text for this week is, Beloved, do not think it strange. Concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing had happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. And when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. It's an interesting uh, warning from Peter. Do not think it strange, a caution. Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial. These are not just just uh, ordinary trials. These are fiery trials. Perhaps he's referencing, uh, even mentally, the uh, Hebrews in Daniel 3 and the fiery furnace, but the fiery trial, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So if you suffer with Christ, you will be glad when he is triumphant. Um, and this seems to be an important point. Uh, I think it is one, and the uh, the author doubles down on it because the first one is about the first text is just the first half of this memory text. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. You know, and we humans, we're an interesting bunch because we do treat uh, the ordinary as though it was strange. For example, we sometimes think that it's a, a matter of erudition and um, sophistication to find fault with something. Well, if we lived in a perfect world, uh, or nearly perfect, then finding the few flaws might be a sign of uh, excellent sensitivity. But we live in an extremely broken down world. Brokenness surrounds us and inhabits us in many, many ways, and nothing is easier to find than flaws. Uh, from my old uh, dog show days, he said, any fool can fault a dog. And anybody can find faults in other people. Can you find things to encourage? But here we are, too. We, you know, it's natural to think. It is the human way to think. Uh, and it is somewhat encouraged by the Scripture, what we would call the wisdom literature, that if one does the right things, that one will be blessed, that only good things will happen. And it took a, a radio show commentator some years ago to, to uh, awaken me to the reality. A very simple thing, which is, don't be surprised when you do the right thing and you're punished for it. You know, that's what happens. And it, it, here we think it's some strange thing, and yet it happens every time. Every day we see people who've lived good lives, and yet they suffer terribly. We see innocent children who have not lived long enough to do something wrong, and they suffer. And so it's just, it's not a strange thing to have a fiery trial. But we somehow think it, it is. And that's why Peter and the lesson author both think it's important to do this. Because like Job and his wife, we do think it strange. That's what Job and his, his friends, all his friends, his, country, his uh, wife, they all think, that is strange that, you know, that Job shouldn't suffer if he's done something, uh, if he hasn't, unless he's done something wrong. And Job says, I didn't do anything to deserve this. And we know from reading the book of Job that he didn't. So this is the first key, and it's a very key understanding. We're going to find a lot of keys in this lesson uh, for various reasons. I will share with my Patreon uh, patrons why I think that is. But in general, uh, it's just there are a lot of keys in this lesson. And uh, their key understandings, not just of this lesson, but of life in general. And that's related to this one, the crucibles that come, that, that, uh, that we shouldn't think it's strange that 
we do right and yet we suffer. And that is that the great controversy is a crucible for God. It is God who is accused in the book of Job. It is God who is accused of doing wrong. We are, in some ways, casualties of this, you know, we're uh, or the collateral damage, to some degree, of this fight between Satan and God. And the difference is that we have a choice. We have a choice. Now, we can't choose whether we're going to suffer or not exactly. We will suffer, as Peter says. We can choose how we react to it. Uh, I say that. I wish I was better at it. Uh, my wife can tell you that I haven't done very well in this little episode with the uh, software problems. But nevertheless, uh, it is possible. And we have a choice to, to make. And it's very difficult, at least for me, to choose when suffering, to choose uh, to glorify God. Uh, Jesus talked about this as well. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And so this is what he's saying it's in John 15. He's saying the night before he's crucified because he's trying to prepare his disciples for what's going to come after the crucifixion and even after the resurrection, where, as we will see, uh, virtually all of the disciples, all but one that we know of, uh, as far as tradition is concerned, died terrible deaths. They were executed. They were tortured in some cases. Uh, and so, you know, Peter is, is uh, and John and John is preparing us by, by relating this statement of, of Jesus. Peter, in the uh, memory text that we had, saying, you know, you're going to suffer. And John here is telling us that Jesus told us, if, if you're going to follow me uh, in my footsteps, then you're going to suffer as I suffer. That's just the way it is. And so we should understand, if we're going to follow Christ, we're going to suffer. God is in a crucible. We talked about the great controversy is a crucible for God. And he is the one who's being tried. He is the one who's suffered. You know, um, I often quote Joseph Stalin. says, one murder is a tragedy. A million murders is a statistic. That's because we suffer from compassion fatigue. But God suffers with everyone who suffers, good and evil. He sees the suffering. And, of course, Jesus took upon himself all of the suffering of the world on the cross. Uh, he took upon himself suffering that none of us needs to uh, experience for ourselves, which is total separation from the Father, the second death. So God's in a crucible. And if we serve him, we'll be in that same crucible with him. Or more accurately, as we see, and we'll get into that in a little bit, he'll be in with, with us. So that's a key understanding. It's a key understanding not just to this lesson, but to the Christian life. And of course, Jesus also said in John, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And But to acknowledge him on this earth is to take a risk is to suffer as he suffered and but he's willing to then take that upon himself uh, he will suffer with us and that's another truth that we're going to see when we suffer for following him he will be with us through the suffering this is one of the problems with the whole idea of the rapture and that we're somehow beamed up uh, just before bad things happen. But the pattern of Scripture, again, is that God goes through the tribulation and trial with us. He does not take us out of it. He comes into it with us. Uh, the most obvious one is the fiery furnace, where they throw in the three Hebrew worthies, and they see four in the fiery furnace, because as Nebuchadnezzar testifies, one like God, one like the Son of Man, he is in there suffering with them. He's helping them through this. Uh, God delivered Noah through the flood, not from the flood. Uh, you could go on and on, and this is the pattern of Scripture. So understand that suffering is a natural and necessary, uh, as we shall soon see, a necessary part 
of the Christian life. I wish I was better at it because uh, I suffer too much for my own miserable sake and don't don't react as well as I should to this. It's something I'm still learning. Um, and I don't, and again, I'm, I'm, I certainly wouldn't claim to do very well at it. But that's a key understanding. When we suffer for following Christ, for following God, he will be with us through that suffering process. And that's a big thing when it is the, the, the people we appreciate the most are the ones who are there for us, with us, when times are tough. Those are the people that we, we can count on. Those are the people we feel best about. We know they're with us. As uh, the saying goes, uh, he's got my back, you know. When someone has your back, you just feel better. So those are some of the crucibles that come. Now, the crucibles of Satan he has listed here. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, we mentioned this before, but I want to link back. It's always important, I think, to link the learning the present uh, order with that previously. Remember in Genesis, we talked about this, that when uh, they were in the garden, the only place that the, the first couple could be tempted was at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is to say, serpent and uh, the serpent who is Satan's agent was located there. And the only that and so if they wanted to be tempted or they were to be tempted, they had to go there. Uh, the serpent did not have freedom to ramble all through the garden. He was he was uh, restricted to that central portion. But then, as soon as they switched their allegiance by believing him, by trusting what he told them rather than what God had told them, uh, he's set loose. They're cast out of the garden, but he's set loose from the garden. He's set loose from that tree. We know that because in Genesis 4, uh, God says to Cain that sin is crouching in his door, ready to pounce on him. Sin is this predatory presence. And now we see... Uh, in First Peter, he's saying essentially the same thing, only from a much later perspective, and that is that the uh, adversary is now like a roaring lion, a predator, and he's looking for someone to devour. So this is what happened. The first couple set Satan loose. They loosed him upon this earth, and now we have to deal with him everywhere, especially within our own lives. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a frightening thing. But notice he's your adversary, the devil. And that is another key point. There are a lot of key points in this lesson. There, there are probably too many. Uh, had I uh, been writing it, I would have written it differently and probably restrained, re, re, you know, at least restricted it to uh, at least five, maybe. But I prefer three. It's easier for people to understand three at a time. Your adversary, the devil. That's important to understand. When we follow Christ, we sort of talked about this just a moment ago. When we, if we're going to be with God, we're going to be in the crucible with him. And the reason for that is that when we follow Christ, his adversary is our adversary. And the great battle, we, the great controversy between you know, the cosmic conflict, it's also called, the, the great controversy between Christ and Satan, when we pick sides, when we pick our side and we, we say we're going to be with Christ, then Satan becomes our adversary. And so don't be surprised if, if the adversary attacks us, as he did Job. And Job was attacked not for doing bad things, but because he was loyal to God, to prove his loyalty even further. So understand, this is a key understanding. Uh, when we are with God, then we're going to be in the crucible with him. When we follow Christ, his adversary is our adversary. And so don't be surprised when that adversary comes after us, as they say, tooth and nail. Then the, the crucibles of sin, and that is to say, when we sin, we put ourselves in a position where we're going to suffer. I put it this way, we, we suffer for our own miserable sake way too many times. 
we like to think we're always suffering for God. I would like to think that, but I know better. Uh, I know better in my better moments, but there are moments when I'm, I'm very angry with God. Uh, this is, uh, maybe it's just me, but that's the way it is. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, this is, this is a, a rather striking passage in Romans 1 because it's all been greetings and good, happy news uh, up until the 18th verse, and then suddenly the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, and it's against, but, you know, there's a tendency we believe what we hear, that God is angry at human beings. But that's not what this verse says, and it's not even what the Old Testament says if we study it carefully. And that is to say, he's not angry at human beings. It says here, he's angry against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Well, aren't we? Uh, and when it comes to those we love, our children, for example, we see them doing things which are not good. We don't hate them. We just wish they weren't suffering. We wish they weren't doing these terrible things. And that's what, what is happening here. God is angry at the things that, uh, that cause us pain and that cause us to be separated from him. Because, and that means to be separated from life. Uh, I had an article in Science many years ago now, I think 18 years ago, uh, Why I Love an Angry God. And the whole point is that when, when we see children suffer, when we see the innocent in pain, when we see the terrible things that happen to people who have done no wrong, we get angry. And that's righteous indignation. It's appropriate anger. The problem is then do we take that anger out on people? Uh, too often we do. Too often what we call abuse is I'm angry, I'm in pain myself, and you're in the way. You happen to be nearby. I want someone else to suffer like I'm suffering, so I yell at you or something like that. This is what happens. And, uh, the, the, you know, we have these, these mass shootings we talk about. Well, uh, it's not the guns, and I'm sorry if that, that offends people. But why do we have so many angry people, so many angry young men especially? And what is causing this? Because angry people hurt, you know, hurt people hurt people, as the one, one book title says. So... My God is not angry against us. He's angry against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness. And as I said in that article about why I love an angry God, we can't, how can we love a God who cares less than we do? He sees suffering and says, ah, well, that's the way it goes. Or, ah, you know, uh, they deserved it. That's not God. God is love. But what he does, what we do in anger is we reach out, we strike out to hit people to make them suffer. What God does is reach out as he did on the cross and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And uh, if we had time, we'd go into forgiveness, which is a whole subject. Uh, I actually have uh, two or three videos on my Patreon channel on forgiveness. And I understand that forgiveness is a very lengthy process, very involved and not easy. But uh, to forgive is not the same thing as to pardon. And that's so important. We, we mistake those two today. We forgive someone means we won't hold it against them. To pardon and to reconcile means that we trust them again. And trust has to be rebuilt. But there's no time to go into that uh, in this lesson. So the wrath of God is not revealed against human beings, but against the unrighteousness and the ungodliness that people do. And we suppress the truth in unrighteousness, which is interesting. They suppress the truth through uh, in uh, in unrighteousness so what this brings us to is another key concept in this lesson again it's it's almost overloaded with key concepts god is the adversary of all unrighteousness and lies he's not in many ways even the even the adversary of lucifer god loves lucifer god loves satan but satan has put himself beyond the reach of that love um and that any of us can do that. He allows, God allows free will. He allows us to make choices because trust is the only way that there can be love. And without trust and love, the universe will fall apart. And so God has to let certain things happen in order that we can trust him. 
but he is therefore the adversary of all unrighteousness and lies because those so distrust. And that has, you, you, one of the reasons that God uh, hates, there's a list of things that he hates, and he hates those who sow discord among brethren. It's people who are getting along. People who have a positive relationship. When you sow discord in that, you, be, you sow distrust. And slowly, the relationship breaks down. It's what happened with Lucifer in heaven. It's what happened with Lucifer on earth when he told humankind, hey, you can't trust God. The relationship broke down. And it's got, it got worse and worse, and only God could repair it. That that also is a, a, an involved topic for another time. But that's the whole point. God is the adversary of all unrighteousness and lies. That's what that text says, because it degrades and makes trust and, and loving relationships impossible. It's slowly, it's like rot, and it just tears them apart. So that's an important key point here. God is the adversary of all unrighteousness and lies. And, and therefore, those who do those things will uh, suffer. They will suffer the natural consequences of what they're doing. They, the trust will be, will, will be taken down. But that's why God is angry at those qualities. He's not angry at people, not angry at his creation. He's angry at the terrible things we do. Uh, it's amazing to remember that when, in the 1950s, when I was a very young child, there was a, a song that by a, a, a woman's tree, I think the Andrews sisters, that was a he, and it was about God. And uh, it talks about he can uh, rule the tide and calm the angry sea. It was number one of the hit parade. It's hard to believe that now in this, in this culture. But one of the things it says, though it makes him sad to say the way we live, and he'll always say, I forget. Well, that's true. He will always forgive us. But we only have pardon if we accept it and move forward. That's a different different issue. But uh, this is why he is the enemy. It makes him sad to see the way we live. It makes him angry when people's relationships fall apart. And we have to deal with that. That's what we need. That's the real the real enemy, for example, is not, let's suppose, because I see this great polarization within our denomination right now, and so we can get very angry at the people on the other side. But that's not the problem. The problem is the distrust. The problem is the things that we do that cause us to fall apart. That's the things. That's where our focus should be. Not on persons or personalities even, but upon trends and ideas which tear us down. And we need to find ways to build those up which isn't by tearing the other person down. That doesn't work. But again, large topics. These are we so many big thoughts in this lesson. There's, uh, like I say, it's too many to really explore for the time allotted. And finally, we have crucibles of purification. Well, purification is what takes place in a crucible. That's the whole purpose of a crucible is that you heat the metal up and the dross is uh, either floats to the top and is skimmed off or is consumed in the fire. Slowly you purify the, uh, the, the ore into a pure metal. And that's what this crucible is a purification of it. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them. For how shall I deal with my, the daughter of my people? By the way, to try them is the same as to put them to the test. And that is what it means when it says that you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not put him to the test. Well, he puts us to the test sometimes. Now, Satan is perfectly capable of putting us to the test. But the point here is that well, those tests are exposing character flaws in us. And we have the opportunity. And again, I'm, I, I don't say this is easy. Most of the things that are really matter in this world are simple, but they're not easy. And I certainly don't claim to have a, a, a real grip on this one. But we have the opportunity in the, in the refining, in the trying circumstances. We have the opportunity to choose the right. By the way, when I say, you know, I, I mean, I, I really uh, struggled through this uh, this recent software problem. It's really been difficult for me, and I haven't handled it particularly well. 
So when I'm saying these things, it's uh, it's like the, the best preachers, you know, I'm preaching to myself. But I'm trying to share with you the struggles that I have and also the experience. This is what we do. We say, here's what God is doing in my life. Well, right now, he's trying me and finding me wanting, but he keeps forgiving me and bringing me back. And I keep coming back for another try. And here's something that uh, I just love this Oswald Chambers quoted in the lesson. If the Spirit of God brings to your mind a word of the Lord that hurts you, and sometimes the word of the Lord does hurt us. If the Spirit of God brings to your mind a word of the Lord that hurts you, you can be sure there's something in you that he wants to hurt. To the point of death. Now that's a tough one. In his book, The Great Divorce, which is an, a lengthy allegory of, of people who have a chance to visit heaven and, uh, and uh, how they react to that. There's a man there who has a, a lizard riding on his shoulder. It's a very ugly little lizard. And the lizard keeps whispering in his ears and telling him bad things. And um, he's met by a heavenly visitor. And the heavenly visitor says, uh, um, may I have, you know, the lizard? And the man panics. Oh, no, 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 no. And finally, uh, he says, if you'll let me do it, I can, I can cure you, you know. And he says, don't hurt him, don't hurt him. And the, the visitor says, well, I don't intend to hurt him. Um, and uh, he doesn't intend to hurt him. And he takes this this lizard, and even the man is as it's going on, no, 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 please, oh, all right, but, but, but be careful. Oh, oh. And he's having great difficulty giving up this little uh, insidious, terrible influence. And the, uh, the, the heavenly visitor flings this thing to the ground in such a way that it breaks its back, and it's just there writhing in pain. And the man is, oh, no, 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 no. And then, slowly, this lizard transformed into a magnificent horse. And the man who had it on his shoulder now can mount the horse and ride around through the glades of heaven. And what a transformation that which was riding him and poisoning him, it now becomes once he lets uh, God or the, the, the Spirit of God take over, transform it, kill it in its present form. It becomes a magnificent uh, addition to his life, a great blessing. And this is, I've seen this in my own life. Sometimes things you don't want to let go become beautiful treasures when you give them over to God, but that's hard to do. Again, <laughs> preaching to the choir. And one story which I have to tell here, you may have heard it before, but I just love the story. It's so, so apt. Jack Hayford, who founded the church, by the way, he's quite elderly now, but he wrote the, uh, the song Majesty, which is a very good worship song. And he had an elder come to him. I heard uh, Jack Hayford tell this on television. And he had an elder come to him and said, you know, people uh, don't like it when you urge them to raise their hands in worship. And he says, well, I don't urge anybody to do anything, but I do encourage it. I think it's a good thing to do. And it is scriptural. And by the way, he's right. Paul says, lifting holy hands. And uh, my own experience is if you lift your hands and spread them out, it's hard to be close to anybody, especially to God. But anyway, whatever you think about that, he says, you know, I, you know, it is a scriptural passage, and, and I think it's a good thing to do. And I says, well, yeah, but he said, you know, these people don't like to do it. And it hurts their pride. When they, when you say this, and Hayford says, oh, oh, he says, well, I, I, I had no intention. I never wanted to hurt their pride. It was my intention to kill it outright. And that's true. It's God's intention to kill our pride outright. outright. Here we have, um, if the Spirit of God hurts you, there's something he wants to hurt to the point of death. He wants to kill our pride outright. Boy, does our pride hurt, you know. Pride can make us very, uh, very sensitive, very injured. And pride is something that is not found in God, but it is the great sin of Lucifer, and it's the great sin that each of us wants to do. So here's another key. Well, we've got a lot of them. When God tries us, it is to strengthen us and to save us. When God tries us, and he does, but he does it for our own good. As Paul says, he chastens those whom he loves. Sometimes you have to discipline children in a way that they don't like because 
You want them to grow into better humans. You want to prepare them for real life. So that's the final key here, all, almost, because I have now given you six key passages, way too many. And so I want to do something about that very quickly here. Here they are. Like Job and his wife and his friends, we do think it's strange when we suffer. We shouldn't, but we do. God is in a crucible, and if we serve him, we will be in that crucible also. That's the way it works. When we suffer for following him, he will be with us through that suffering. We said this is the pattern of scripture. It's always the same. It isn't that God delivers us from uh, trials, from suffering. He delivers us through suffering if we will let him. Unfortunately, I don't always let him. When we follow his cry, follow Christ, his adversary is our adversary. The great controversy between Christ and Satan becomes the great controversy with us against, with Satan against us is the best way to put it. And there we are. God is the adversary of all unrighteousness and lies because they break down relationships. They make trust, uh, they trust follows, and it makes any kind of uh, healthy relationships impossible. And finally, when God tries us, and he does sometimes, it is to strengthen us and to save us. Now, this can be boiled down further. There are six keys. These are all important things, which is why I went ahead and highlighted them. But they can be boiled down even further. And we'll do that here into two. If we are with God, we will be persecuted by Satan. There's a great controversy. We choose side. And then the second one is whatever sin remains within us, God will try us so that we may be with him. That sin will be purged and we can become, we can be with him. He wants us to spend eternity with him. Well, I apologize again for the lateness of this, the tardiness of this. I know that by the time it comes out, it'll be too late for some of my friends in Australia. Uh, I can only do what I can do, and I, I can't be up 24 hours a day in the software, and I just had a catastrophic failure, which had to be completely redone. But anyway, uh, here it is. Again, if you want to reach me, you can reach me at BibleJourneys at Yahoo.com. If you want to have much more material uh, including outlines and printed out slides and the slideshow itself. These are all available at different levels of participation on the Patreon page at uh, patreon.com slash Bible Journeys. But whatever, I'm honored that you joined me, and I hope that we can meet again in uh, another few days for another Bible journey, and that each one of these journeys will lead us closer to home and closer to